This is the third video on predictive functional control and now we start looking in more detail at some underlying concepts. The simplest PFC, which was covered in the previous video, assumes the future input will be constant and we just choose this value. So there we go, we're just going to choose the input or the expected input to be a constant. However, at every sample we might update what we think this value should be and that ensures both feedback and gives us the facility to ensure offset free tracking. Now the previous video established that if we make the choice UK equals the expected steady state value to give us offset free tracking then you end up with a very simple control law that works well for some cases but not where the open loop dynamics are undesirable. So what do we do in practice? We've got a human-based concept here. When you decide on a control action, we've actually got an implicit concept in our head of how fast we wish to approach a target. So you'll see here, we've got some different targets. We might want to follow this blue target. We expect a relatively fast convergence. Alternatively, we might think that this red target is more reasonable. The key thing is we have a concept in our head of how fast do we expect the output to go from the start point to the end point. And PVC wants to use this concept, the concept of desired settling time, or how fast do we go from where we start to where we finish. Now for simplicity, what PFC does is it relates this back to simple first order dynamics and you remember a key underlying part of PFC is you want to keep things simple and that's why we're using first order models. So here's the first order model G equals 1 over 1 plus TS I've given it a step input 1 over S and you can show that for zero initial conditions the output has this form. Now with this form settling time is usually taken to be 3 to 4 time constants. In other words, something like 3 capital T will give you a 5% error. So we're going to use 3 time constants. Some people use 4 time constants if they're looking at 2% errors. An example then. You'll see here I'm going to choose G equals 2 over 1 plus 3S and this is the sort of response that you will get. You'll notice the steady state value up here is 2 which corresponds to that 2 up there. And you'll also notice that t seconds, 2 t seconds, 3 t seconds are key parameters in the response time. But here, t equals 3. So you'll notice there's a 3 there, there's a 6 there, there's a 9 there. And the dynamics are very much governed by your choice of this t and your choice of the gain. Here's an example then. We want to get this response as shown in the figure. You'll see we've got a blue line and we're saying in my head I've got a concept of roughly what I want. So the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to say okay roughly how long before I get down to about 5% error and you'll see I've drawn this vertical line here to indicate in my head I've got a concept that my settling time is about 6 seconds. So what I do so I say, therefore, the corresponding time constant is I divide that by 3, 6 over 3, or 2. And therefore, my ideal target is going to be 1 over 1 plus 2s. So that's the first step in a PFC. Get yourself an ideal target and express that using some form of time constant. So the challenge. So we've got a human-based concept of ideal behavior or ideal dynamics. How do we get the closed loop system to have this behavior while using simple computation, simple coding, and obviously exploiting prediction because that makes sense? So PFC uses the principle that the future input will be constant during prediction. We've done that before. This input is chosen, and this is the key point, is chosen so that the output prediction matches the desired target trajectory at a single point. That's the key part of PFC. You've got your target which has the desired dynamic and you force your prediction to match the target at a single point. The decision you make is what input will force this 
matching. But obviously you update that every sample and then you get feedback. So the hope is that by repeatedly choosing the input values, which give predictions with the desired dynamic, then the closed loop will implicitly inherit that desired dynamic. Now you can show that in some cases this is guaranteed and in other cases it's not. But conceptually you can see it makes sense. So here's an example of what we're trying to do. You'll see this black line here. This is the target. So in our head this is roughly what we want the system to do. And what we're going to do is choose the input so that our actual output response, which is this red line, matches the target at a specified point. So our hope is that by forcing this matching it will make the output converge at roughly the same rate as the target. So here we're going to try and find a fixed value of input u0 equals u1 equals u2 and so on to force coincidence at the so-called coincidence point. How do we go about this then? Well you can see here on this example I've overlaid the responses of the system for different values of input. I've said what happens if the input's 1? What happens if the input's 1.1? What happens if it's 1.2? And what I'm trying to do is find the value that will give me coincidence at this point here. And hopefully you can see that if I choose u to be about 1.25 then I will have a response that goes through that point. And so my decision making process reduces to finding the input value that forces that coincidence. Now in practice the initial output might be non-zero. Here you can see I'm starting from an initial value of 0.4 and therefore we have to sketch our target or first order response as starting at 0.4 and going to the desired steady state. And nevertheless we can still do this coincidence calculation. Here I'm using five seconds ahead. There's a key point however in this slide that you need to notice. Forcing coincidence here five seconds ahead does not mean you force coincidence at other parts of the prediction. So other parts of the prediction there will be a difference between your ideal target and what the predicted output is doing. And that is one of the weaknesses of PFC, but in many cases that weakness does not matter. So remarks, we're going to leave to one side for now analysis of the underlying assumption that repeatedly matching predictions at a single point will imply the resulting closed loop behavior is close to what we want. We're going to take it for granted that our human based intuition tells us in many cases that will do a good job for us. It can be argued and indeed it can be proved in some cases that this is intuitively reasonable and matches common human behavior if the underlying system has a dynamic close to a first order response. However, it's less obvious for more complex open loop dynamics and thus that's considered later on. So an illustration, we're going to take a first order model you can see here and with this first order model I can write down the predictions explicitly. So here they are. The predicted value n samples ahead is going to be 0.25 times 1 minus 0.8 to the power n over 1 minus 0.8 times whatever value I've selected for u plus 0.8 to the n times y of 0. And that's fairly easy to derive if you have a first order model. And that's one of the nice things about PFC. If you make simple assumptions, you can write explicit algebra that's easy to derive and easy to code. Now our desired dynamic we're going to say I want the pole to be at 0.7 and therefore my desired dynamic is the target n samples ahead it's going to be y of 0 that's my initial condition plus r minus y of 0 times 1 minus 0.7 to the power n and again you'll see I can write this down explicitly it's fairly simple maths. So what we want to do now is find the current input which will make the output n samples ahead match the target. In other words, we want to make these two values the same. We're going to force coincidence of our prediction with our target. So I've written those two equations down again. Okay, and the only, only difference here is I've written them both as yn. We want to make both of those equal. So you can see here we've got our target and over here we've got 
our prediction. And all we're doing is making those the same. And clearly there is only one unknown. Here it is, u of 0. Everything else in this equation is known. So I can solve for u of 0 explicitly and just write the answer down by inspection. Now that algebra is still relatively simple. You see this 0 0.7 to the power n, that's your target dynamic. This 0 0.8 to the n, that's your process dynamic. And you'll see those two terms come in in two places. But bottom line is it's a very simple control law and I can write it down explicitly. And that's the nice thing. There's no complicated loops, no iterations, no messing about. I can just write it down. There's the answer. So we're going to do some MATLAB examples. As ever, these examples are on the Google sites if you want to get the code for yourself. Here's the first example. What I've gone done here is I've used n equals 5 and I want to see does this control law actually deliver the dynamic I want and you'll see I've put in black my target dynamic and in red the actual dynamic or closed loop dynamic that has resulted and you can judge you can say is PFC effective now you might say well actually those are quite close together I've nearly delivered the dynamic I want what if I change the coincidence point? So now let's try 8. And there's the interesting point. If you make n larger, in this particular case, PFC is less effective. You actually are not getting as close to your target. But conversely, if I try n equals 3 as my coincidence point, now you can see that these two are very close together. I've almost achieved my desired dynamic exactly. So what this is illustrating is PFC as a strategy can deliver what you want or can deliver very close to what you want despite being very simple. So observations. We can find a choice of n, here we showed three, um, such that the close loop behavior is close to the desired behavior. And this is notwithstanding the fact that all we did was match predictions at a single point. It was a very, very simple strategy, and yet it seems to be effective. Consequently, PFC could be viewed as an effective control design in that the coding is elementary, and the only design tools were, what's my desired time constant? And I then have to do, and this is the keyword, a search for a suitable coincident horizons over a small set of integers. So I just did 3, 5 and 8 and said, look, 3 seems to be best. In general, you might want to search over a few more, but you will usually find a reasonable answer. So in summary, we've introduced a beginner level PFC algorithm. The basic concept is to select a single input value in order to match the output prediction n steps ahead to a target trajectory with a specified dynamic or settling time. The efficacy has been demonstrated on a first order system. However, the link between the target dynamic and the closed loop dynamics that actually result requires a careful choice of coincidence horizon. If you get the coincidence horizon wrong, it doesn't seem to work very well. And we haven't yet discussed how we ensure offset free tracking and constraints, and we will do that later.